Good morning and welcome to DEC Online. It's a beautiful day outside. Mark, has, uh, I'm recording this here with my friend uh, Mark, who's going to be praying with us a little bit later on. How are you this morning, Mark? Nervous. Nervous? Nervous. Why are you nervous about? Because I don't do Zooms and <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. And again, you needn't cut that out. Cameras can be a little bit intimidating, yes, they, can't they, yes, at the beginning? Yes, yes. Talking into them. It's much easier talking to people, isn't it? It is. I would rather do that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, listen, anyway, and Mark, Mark is going to be praying live in the church on Sunday, as I'm going to be speaking live in the church on Sunday. So, this is the recording that's going out. Thank you. Uh, so, we'll now go to our first worship song. got to enjoy the good weather that we've had in the last week when it hasn't been just lashing rain or hailstoning. Um, the last week uh, with the good weather I have taken the chance to do some gardening um, which I don't do very often but everyone's been really really busy recently and 
the garden's just gotten a bit messy and it's a bit all over the place. So I spent some time on the nice days in the evenings um, just out in the garden cutting the grass and pulling up the weeds that had grown. There's, there's plenty of weeds to be gotten rid of. But whenever I was picking them up I found something that looked a little bit different than the rest of them. And so I had another look at it, uh, I dug it up, and it was something that looked just like this. Now I don't know if you can guess what that is, but it is an avocado seed. And this little avocado seed had made its way all through the composter, from our house, into the bin, back out into the soil. And it had sprouted, and there was this little shoot coming up from it with little leaves amongst all the weeds in the garden. And so I dug it up and I planted it in this little pot. Uh, and I'm hoping that it will grow into a big tree. And I'll be able to have my own avocados from my own avocado tree. In our video today uh, on Right Now Media, they talk a little bit about seeds and about new life too and how as Christians we have this new life. But it's not new life that comes from seeds that die. It comes from God's living message, from God's word that never dies and that lasts forever. My avocado tree, as sad as it makes me, probably won't make it through the next eight years and I won't have avocados of my own from my own tree just yet. But I do have something. I have God's word that lasts forever and that never dies. Not like the flowers or the grass in the field. It lasts forever and it will never die. So if you guys want to head on over when you get a chance to Right Now Media. Uh, and we're on episode 5 in our series in First Peter. And Phil is going to go through these verses a little more in detail with you guys. Well, hi again. And uh, we continue today in our series on the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, where we're looking at the whole concept, our thoughts of spiritual maturity. And Paul was writing to a rather immature church in Corinth, a church that was full of gifts, that was full of amazing people who had seen uh, God do amazing things, and yet spiritually they were quite immature. So over the last while, we've looked at uh, worship services and how they worked in the church uh, in Corinth about the um, important part of head coverings, uh, what that meant, and uh, uh, the, the issue Paul had with the church bringing outside influences and things that were wrong in the outside world into the church services and how uh, the Lord's Supper even was being abused between the rich and and the poor. In the current section that we're looking at, we're looking at the uh, spiritual gifts, gifts given by the Holy Spirit to the church and their abuse and use within the church. And so you might reasonably ask a question, how can a spiritual gift be abused, something that's given by God? And if I was to say one word in relation to that, I would say the word attitude. It's all about the attitude that we have in using the gift that God has given us. So far, we've looked at how the gifts are recognized, how they're distributed by the Holy Spirit, and the fact that not everybody gets the same gift. Indeed, the Holy Spirit is the one who chooses what gift we get and when, and the fact that all gifts that the Holy Spirit gives are really important. And, you know, Paul used that analogy of the human body and talked about how when everything fits together properly, uh, that's when the body works and how much we all need each other. That we shouldn't be pitting one gift against the other. God has placed us where he wants us to be with good reason. And that there should be no gift that dominates over 
another one. It's very important, therefore, that our attitudes are right and that we don't try and dominate over each other and that we don't try and elevate ourselves or push ourselves to the top of the pile, as it were, uh, or want to be seen in that way. But that God gives gifts and that we celebrate the gifting that God has given everybody, one with another, and that there's parity of esteem within the church for everybody. And this is really where spiritual maturity comes in because it means that we um, stand back ourselves, allow others to shine in as much as that is possible, that we celebrate everybody's gifts and what God has given them and celebrate everybody in the body, understanding that everyone is important regardless of what they do. Now, Paul singles out two uh, of the gifts that are most dividing the Corinthian church um, and they are prophecy and tongues and we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll define exactly what they are uh, in a minute or two. You remember that uh, last week we went through that really important section of the uh, letter where Paul talks about what love is and uh, he defines love in uh, that wonderful uh, chapter. But remember, he's defining it in relation to spiritual gifts and in relation to the church in Corinth. And so, he, he, you know, there's a context to it and the context uh, is in relation to how people behave in the church body. So I believe that within this section that we're going to look at today, there are two important points which we are forced to engage with. And that is the question of balance and of motivation, two critical areas of church life. Sometimes we can lose the big picture, the meta-narrative, because we get too caught up in minutia, the small things. And we can get caught up with ourselves or fail to see what the church is supposed to be and what the church is supposed to be doing. We become unbalanced or our motivation gets a bit screwed up. So we're going to read uh, the chapter, or the first part of the chapter, in a, in a few different, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, bite-sized chunks. And so we're going to read the first uh, five verses together now of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14 and uh, verses 1 to 5. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. And we praise God for his word and uh, how it speaks to us. So let me first of all try and define prophecy. We can think of prophecy, uh, I think when we, we hear that word, we think of it as uh, talking about the future, about somehow setting out something that happens or events that may happen uh, in the future. Or we may think about it referring to the end times, end times prophecy about when Jesus comes back, about when world events will uh, change. Uh, and we think about uh, also maybe spontaneous words of the Spirit that are dropped into our minds, uh, supernatural thoughts that come from God. Maybe a special revelation that God has given. And so that word prophecy conjures up thoughts in our minds. However, I think that prophecy can refer to all of those things or does refer to all of those things. But also in this context also refers to a wider communication 
that is a message from God, that there's a wider definition, and it refers to any communication, basically, that comes from God and that is spoken. So that takes in both expository uh, teaching, that is explaining what the Bible means, taking in historical and theological context, language and liter literature type, etc. Uh, that's generally done after a great deal of uh, study and work, but also spontaneous messages that the Spirit may give at certain times. I think sometimes we can get too worked up about definitions, about exactly what they mean, um, and I think that the definition that Paul uses here in relation to prophecy is quite a broad one. And because he uses other terms for speaking, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, he's not just using terms uh, to say pretty much the same thing. Also then, when he talks about tongues, he refers to speaking in an unknown language. In the Greek, glos al alia. Some of you might be quite familiar with the gift and others do not, uh, and others uh, not so much. As a gift of the Holy Spirit, the person who speaks in tongues often finds that the gift brings them closer to God and it's a very intimate way of worshipping with him. Firstly, there were some churches in the past um, have said that everybody who has been uh, um, baptized by the Spirit, everybody who's a believer should speak in tongues. That's not biblical. And um, there is no suggestion in, in here from what Paul is saying that everyone should speak in tongues. Uh, the gift is given to some people and not to everyone. Some people would suggest that the gift that we see today is just manufactured by man and no longer given by the Spirit. That's quite a claim when you consider the growth of the Pentecostal and charismatic church in the world. By far the fastest growing part of the church for the last 30 years. So I think we, this is an area where we certainly do need balance, where first of all we recognise that God gives gifts and just because we may not personally or in the church have much experience of a certain gift does not mean that it's not given by God. It certainly does not mean that it's not valid. Also, uh, we also, the other side of the balance is that the gift is not given to everyone and nobody should feel in any way lesser because they do not have this gift. And so in the Corinthian uh, church, Paul is trying to provide some balance. And it seems rather obvious what's happening. Many people are speaking in tongues at the meeting and some of them are showing off and assuming that because they have this gift that somehow they're more spiritual and they're showing off to the other people in the church. I suppose it's one of the gifts that is easily identifiable as supernatural. And so it was perhaps being greatly valued as a gift within the church uh, and perhaps exalted above other gifts in a way that it shouldn't have been. Now let me get this clear, Paul is not knocking speaking in tongues as a gift, but he does say that speaking intelligible words will have a greater effect in building up the church body. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging and comfort. That's what preaching and sharing God's word is supposed to do, to strengthen, encourage and give comfort. And I suppose I'm going to try and remember that a bit more as uh, I'm speaking. Of course, with the gift of tongues, you can't actually do that. You can't uh, encourage, strengthen and comfort others because it is a rather private gift. It's essentially a personal gift that's between the individual person and God. So what Paul is encouraging is the use of gifts that builds everybody up when they are together in the church. And this is why this comes straight after the section where he's been talking about love. Because worship is a corporate event in which everyone is there to participate and be blessed together. It's not just simply a series of individuals getting together to worship privately. It's a corporate event where the family comes together to worship together. 
And those who were speaking in tongues at the meeting were largely engaged in private worship. Which is more appropriate, I think Paul was saying, to do at home because it doesn't build everybody up. Unless, of course, there was somebody there to interpret what the tongue was and that there was an interpretation. And then we could, of course, legitimately call that interpreted tongue prophecy, a word from God. Now, the gift of tongues at the time um, and the way it was expressed was not exclusive to the Christian church. There was lots of cults in the first century who had all sorts of uh, ecstatic worship going on. Sometimes people would be going into trances and uh, Paul referred earlier on in, uh, in, in his letter to this as people consorting with demons or at least consorting with the demonic, that there was things going on. And there are always fakes that go on. Wherever there is truth and reality in God's kingdom, I think Satan tries to provide some sort of a fake alongside it as well. And so we come to the second uh, part of the reading and we're going to go on from verse 6 to verse 12. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the pipe or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played until there is a distinction in the notes. Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. So, I don't know about you, but uh, one of the things I tend to do on a Saturday night is uh, I love watching uh, sometimes silly TV shows on a Saturday night that just, you know, are chill out shows. And one of the ones that I watch with uh, uh, some of my family at the moment is called I Can See Your Voice, which is on uh, BBC. And the contestants try to guess whether the uh, people in front of them, the singers, are good or bad singers. And uh, there's a number of ways in which they do that and they can win money. Some of the bad singers are so bad, they are absolutely hilariously funny. And uh, that's what really makes the show quite good. Some years ago, I was at a rugby match. Uh, I remember standing with a friend of mine and who I'd never heard sing. And uh, the music started off for Hour on Levine. It was a very passionate day as we, we sang for Ireland playing against England. Uh, and um, this particular individual, who I really hope is not watching <laughs> this this morning, I could not believe that he sang the whole of Aaron Levine on one note, that he never changed note at all. And um, he was completely uh, tuneless. What creates beautiful music is the distinction between notes. Beauty is created by clarity. And so Paul takes three examples just to explain what he means when he's talking about the gifts of tongues uh, v. prophecy. And the first one, uh, he takes a musical uh, example where he talks about the individual notes being played by ancient instruments of the flute and the harp, which if badly, he says, just make a din. When I was uh, a young boy, uh, I, I started to learn the recorder, as so many kids do in uh, primary school. And I was on a trip down to my grandmother's house uh, in Meath one day with my dad. And uh, he said to me, why don't you uh, take out the recorder and play your grandmother a tune? And I was just uh, very much beginning to learn to play at the time. So I tried to play her a tune, which was really terrible. And uh, she sat back in her chair and she said to me, now that sounds like the tune that the old cow died on. 
So I realized at that stage I had to practice an awful lot more before um, I was going to be playing the recorder for my grandmother again. Paul isn't saying that speaking in tongues is like a bad tune, but rather that if it is done to simply show how spiritual a person is rather than a loving act that builds up the whole church, it's a bit like a resounding gong or a, clang a clanging cymbal. You, you know where those words come from, the previous chapter. He says, you're not, it's not really saying anything at all. It's not decipherable. There's no clarity. And the second example he gives is of a military trumpet. And military trumpets didn't just sound good. We hear them used a lot, I suppose, particularly uh, uh, in the UK with the, the royal family and so on, or at big events, um, where uh, military trumpets can be used to signify uh, uh, great occasions and in, in official use. But at that time, they were used in the army to relay messages to the troops. And so the blast, a particular blast on a trumpet really meant something. It may be meant advance or attack or retreat or whatever. But the commander would give the, um, the, the command to the trumpeter to play whatever it was to signify the uh, uh, troop movement in a particular way. And of course, this was before that we had, they had radio contact, which they didn't have in Roman times. And so uh, we also know that in, in Corinth at the time, there was many retired uh, Roman legionnaires, and so um, they would have got this one uh, pretty quickly. And so he's saying that the, 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 the actual sound that is made by the trumpet has a very particular point. It communicates to the troops. And so tongues might sound good, but clear communication is required for the church body to move forward. And that's why Paul, I believe, uses this example. He says there needs to be clarity. And the third example is being like in a place where everyone is speaking in a foreign language and you don't have a clue what's going on. Now, that's happened to me a number of times. I remember being in a church in Bosnia where the church service went on for, I think, three or four hours. It was a very long church service. And thankfully, the pastor's wife spoke to us in English to translate what was going on. Otherwise, we would have sat there without a clue and we wouldn't have just known anything that was going on. And uh, likewise, I was in a church in Romania, again, where um, you know, people were speaking Romanian, obviously. And while there's real beauty in listening to other people's languages, like we, we, like we did here at the carol service, where we had uh, nine different languages being spoken, which was really beautiful. Um, you can do that in short bursts, but if, 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 if you're trying to understand and have clarity and you don't understand what's going on, then it can be very difficult. It also happened to me in Belfast as well. The first time I went up there and I remember listening to the people talking, I had no idea what they were talking about. They, they could have been talking in Dutch and it just uh, it took me a while to kind of tune in to realise they were actually talking English. So Paul is saying, uh, the point is that if you don't know what is being said, you're still in the dark. So Paul is a, appealing to the Corinthian church for some reflection and maturity so that they will all grow together, that they'll be grown up, there'll be grown up worship in the church and not chaos. And um, I don't believe that he was trying to give them a whole new set of rules, uh, you know, and sometimes people can use scriptures like this to say, oh, you can't do that because this is what Paul says and the rules should be this and the rules should be that but he's rather trying to help them to understand themselves. So to the final part of the reading. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may be able to interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the Spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say, Amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you are saying? You are given thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. In the law, it is written, 
with other tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers but for believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquires or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Some Christians pit one gift against another. And this passage uh, suggests that, uh, and they use this passage to suggest that tongues has no part uh, to play in a worship service. Personally, I've been blessed to be with Christians singing in tongues, and I found it really rather beautiful and encouraging. I think Paul is saying to the church, come on, grow up a bit. Would you? Would you just grow up a little bit? Stop acting like children who think primarily about themselves and consider each other, but also consider those who are investigating the faith. I remember a man told me one day he came to faith by simply hearing other Christians singing and worshipping together because he, he, he listened to them for ages outside. And then he went into the church and he just said, I want what you have. And, he, and, and very, very soon afterwards, he came to faith when they explained uh, what Jesus had done for him. And Paul quotes uh, from a passage that, uh, uh, from the prophet Isaiah, where Israel is condemned by God. And he says that, uh, Isaiah says that the words of the Assyrians who defeated the Israeli armies and who they could not understand, it was like all babbling to them, um, that God uses this to you know, try and turn them back to himself again. It's a sign that they haven't been listening. It's a sign of God's judgment. Likewise, those who do not know Christ, who are condemned, may not be convinced even by spiritual words. Speaking in tongues can act as a form of sign to non-believers that will make them stop and think about judgment. People have, uh, many interpreters have, have, have really struggled with this over the years because it seems to be the wrong way round. Tongues are a sign for unbelievers and prophecy for believers. You would have said, does, does, does he not actually say the exact opposite of this in the next couple of verses? Because he seems to go on to say that. But what actually Paul says is, well, sign, uh, the tongues is a sign for non-believers um, not that they will be instructed by them, because they can't. But as John Chrysotom wrote in the 3rd century, tongues are assigned to unbelievers not for their instruction, as prophecy is, but for both believers and unbelievers, but to astonish them. If he's right, and I think he is, Paul was saying to the Christians, listen, you're used to all this. This is part of what you see every Sunday when you get together. Tongues is no sign of someone's spirituality. However, for the skeptic who is not accepting the prophetic word being spoken, when they heard somebody speaking in tongues and then somebody else perhaps interpreted, they may be utterly amazed and brought to the sense of judgment of, of conviction by the Spirit. And likewise, if a visitor to the church decides not to accept what they understand with their mind, it will only benefit the believers who listen. Finally, my experience has been that Christians from different sides of the camp, both non-charismatic and charismatic, have tried to use Paul's words to prove their own point of view. And in doing so, I believe that often we have missed the very point that he was trying to make. Worship is firstly an act of love, firstly to God, but also to each other, and in one, one in which we also try and reach out to other people who are non-believers. We're all different, both personally and corporately. Churches are different, people are different. But we have an awful lot to learn from each other. The body needs balance. 
Balance between cognition and sensory. Balance between that of the mind and that of the emotions. We need both. When we worship with our bodies, experientially, if you like, we can feel the Holy Spirit in our midst. And it's wonderful. It's like in a marriage relationship. The stuff in our heads, the fact that we love somebody, also has to get to our emotions too, or else it will be very dry. However, sensory worship on its own will soon fizzle out unless there is cognition or intellectual growth as well. We need to worship with our minds and our intellect as well. And so it's through studying and considering the word of God and prophecy that we grow. We need both parts of a worshipping church so that we can be balanced. And I pray that God would come help us to be mature, to grow us up so that indeed many would come here and fall down and say, surely God is among you. Let it be so, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
And so, by back, Mark, you're going to lead us in prayer this morning. Yeah. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. From 1 Thessalonians 3.11, following on from last week's Love, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 3.11 in, in 1 Thessalonians. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. And over to 2 Corinthians 1, the God of all comfort. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the Lord of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over, into our lives, so also through Christ, our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patience, endurance, of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. Thank you, Father, for this word. And I just, uh, Lord, put it on my heart, and I just want to thank Dougie for all, and Pastor Dougie, Pastor Ross, Ben, Pastor Ben, for all the work that they've done throughout this season, this pandemic. Father, we ask you to bless them. Well, we know you've blessed them, but protect them, Lord, and uh, yeah, wisdom from heaven, Lord, wisdom from heaven, and by your Holy Spirit, to, 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 till we're able to meet again. Um, fully and able to praise and worship you in spirit and in truth. We just ask you, Lord, to protect them and thank you for them. We want to honour you, Dougie, for all the work you've done in the mighty name of Jesus. And we want to honour Ross for all the work he's done and Ben and for all the elders. And the blessings of the Lord are upon you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. That was unexpected. I wasn't expecting that this morning. Well, but I appreciate it greatly. Yeah, but we have to honour you, you know. As I said to you, God started a good work of me and he's going to bring it to completion. Okay, Slowly, you know. Yeah. It's changing my heart now. Okay. But it took six, seven years. Well, it's a lifetime. It takes a, it takes a lifetime yes, for all of us yes. for our hearts to be changed and for us to grow. And that, I suppose, is the whole series that we've been doing in First Corinthians is about spiritual maturity, about growing up in the faith yeah. and about learning. And, I mean, if anything, uh, you know, from... Patrick, I suppose, really hit the you know the central team last yeah, week. But you it's hit it all too. All about love, you know. It's Three all about years, four years ago, whatever it was. But it does. It, it's been asking. Sometimes you don't feel. Forget about the feelings. If the word says he's God, is love, right? And he came to live in our hearts, or he pours out the spirit into our hearts. I have to believe that. Yeah. Now, my actions might be contradictory to that. If you have a temper, or you have this and that. But he started, that's what I'm trying to say. I now believe the scripture. I repent and said, Lord God, forgive me for not believing Romans 5, 5. The love of God is poured into your heart. Mm. God knows I want the love. Yeah. But he didn't know how to. Mm. And it's a slow, as you say, without people telling you, you know, I thought the born again Christianity, oh, you become, you know, nearly perfect. Well, <laughs> it's far from it. The human, <laughs> human side. I'm, t I'm trying to say, I thought I'd be more perfect than you are now. Yeah. Uh, we'll join the club. We all thought that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because no one told me any different. Yeah. But the truth is, of course, is that we kind of, I think we find it quite hard to assess ourselves a lot of the time, right? Because we're, we're looking at ourselves every day in the mirror. And sometimes that's quite difficult, especially with a face like mine. Whereas, uh, we're, you know, but from the outside, people are looking at us and they see how much our lives have changed. And you do realise that God's love utterly changes our lives. Yeah. As we, uh, as it's we, the greatest thing. Yeah, because I think if we love people, we, you know, it takes away judgmentalism yeah. and t t takes so away all, say, so I many say, things. I says to the Lord, I want to. You know, we want to love. Well, how can I? How can I feel that when I don't believe you love me? It's a place that you have to get there slowly. Yeah. He probably have to bring you through a lot of heartache to get you there. Yeah. You know, if you hear a Christian saying this about someone else. Like, I didn't read that thing there now, the anointed. 
it's a it's a prevalent scripture, but it can be done another time. Mm. But we had to thank you because what I hear from people like I've seen you here working on, relentlessly, you know. I'm Ross and Ben, but what 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 we were saying is, look, like, you need to be honouring not only your governments and all these things, even though you mightn't agree with what they do, but it starts in your home with your mum and dad and all this, but especially your church. We're we're commanded to love one another. We're not asked. No, it's it's, it's so. And then, then when they're saying that you've, you're not hitting that mark, see that 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 be me trying to be saying I put all my energy into drinking and and, and, and just abusing myself. Yeah, you know, looking for love with girls and if they didn't match up to it, and I, I, you went, I wasn't finding it. No. Then I'm on to the next one. Then I'm on to the next. Couldn't get married. Mm. You know, I'm totally different than than what I was then. Thanks yeah. be to God. Yeah. But it's, it's him that's doing it. That's it. And he pours his love into us and changes us. And, um, you know, and sometimes it's a lot slower than we want it to. The processes of he, sanctification is slower than we want it to be. We, he knows we my end, right? Yeah, he does so know he end. knows that I want to love him with yeah. all my heart and then to love my neighbour as myself, right? That was, a, that was a wake up call. Yeah. That really shook me to the core. The, the expert in the law says to, 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 to Jesus, what, what should I do to inherit, mm -hmm. inter, inherit eternal life? And he's saying, the first one, love the Lord our God with our, all your hearts, all mind and strength. And the second is to love your neighbour. And I'm going, how can we not even do that? Mm. Two. That's everything is in them too when I'm going. Because love knows no wrong then. It's sincere, it's loving, it's kind. Yeah. And it doesn't want to hit back. Or get even if someone treats you wrong. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. God bless those yeah. who treat you, you know. So it's a slow process. But it I, tell is. You, it's I think hard. a lot of it is about turning around the natural instincts yeah. of anger yeah. and of, you know, jealousy, resentment and all those things. Yeah. Rejection, Tradition. abandonment, all yeah. those things. Is a way them. So thanks for being here with us this morning. And, uh, so, uh, and thanks for joining us this morning. And thanks to uh, David for earlier on for doing the... Uh, Kids lot and to my good friend Mark here for praying with us this morning. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed our time together and um, we'll see you again next week. God bless.